Okay, this is an introductory video that goes over the very basics of skew t log p diagrams used ubiquitously in meteorology. So this is a skew t log p diagram, also known as a thermodynamic diagram or a sounding diagram. There are five sets of lines in this diagram and we are going to go over each one of them one by one. So the first two are the name are in the name of the diagram. The T in skew T refers to temperature, which is our horizontal axis and spans the typical range of temperatures observed in the atmosphere from about negative 50 to 50 degrees Celsius. And then the P in skew T log P refers to pressure, which is our vertical axis where up can literally be interpreted as being up in the atmosphere. This pressure axis ranges from typical sea level pressures of around 1,000 millibars to pressures typical of the upper troposphere or lower stratosphere of around 100 millibars. The log in log P refers to the fact that the pressure axis is scaled logarithmically, which can be seen by these 100 millibar intervals increasing in spacing as you go up the vertical axis, which we are thinking of as up in the atmosphere here. We can see that these logarithmic decreases of pressure correspond to linear increases in altitude in terms of distance, which we can see on the right vertical axis. The skew in skew t refers to the fact that the lines of constant temperature, or isotherms, are skewed 45 degrees clockwise, which is mostly done out of convenience so that we can plot a wider range of temperatures in a more compact space. But this skewing makes these charts a little counterintuitive for those who have not worked with them before. So for example, if we imagine that we measure temperature going up in the atmosphere and it looked like a vertical line on this diagram, our first intuition might be that temperature is constant with height. But this is not the case. Instead, we can see that we are continuously crossing lines of constant temperature and thus temperature is decreasing with height. It may be easier to see this if we momentarily unskew the temperature axis, showing a negative slope in our hypothetical measured temperature. So this is a temperature pressure space, and thus we have one set of lines representing temperature and one set representing pressure, but we have three more sets of lines to explain. The first of the remaining set of lines that we will explain is water vapor mixing ratio, or the ratio of the mass of water vapor in the air to the mass of everything else in the air, which includes nitrogen, oxygen, argon, increasingly CO2, etc. And this is in grams per kilogram. When mixing ratios are plotted in this temperature pressure space, they're telling us how much water vapor can be contained within a parcel of air of a given temperature and pressure. This is known as the saturation mixing ratio. So a parcel of air with a pressure of 700 millibars and a temperature of 15 Celsius would hypothetically be able to support as much as 15 grams of water vapor for every kilogram of dry air. Another way of saying this is that at 15 grams of water vapor per kilogram of dry air, this air parcel would become saturated and any additional water vapor added to the parcel would condense and form clouds. We can see that at the coldest temperatures on the diagram, the atmosphere will have a capacity to contain only a very, very small amount of water vapor. And at the warmest temperatures on the diagram, the atmosphere can accommodate around 40 grams of water vapor per kilogram of dry air, or close to 4% of the atmosphere by mass. Now if, in addition to the temperature, we also measure the dew point temperature of this hypothetical parcel of air, we can plot that in this temperature pressure space as well. The dew point temperature is telling us the amount of water vapor actually in that parcel of air, in this case 10 grams per kilogram. This means that this parcel is subsaturated since it contains less water vapor than it would possibly be able to accommodate. It contains 10 grams per kilogram, but it can potentially accommodate 15 grams per kilogram. This ratio, by the, by the way, of 10 grams per kilogram divided by 15 grams per kilogram is the definition of relative humidity, which is thus around 67% in this case. Now, the other two sets of lines are both called adiabats. They represent how a hypothetical air parcel's temperature will change when it is displaced in the vertical direction, but no heat is allowed to be added or subtracted from the parcel. So in these cases, we are imagining that all temperature changes are coming from adiabatic expansion or compress compression, the parcel doing work on its environment or the environment doing work on the parcel, 
and or the release or sequestration of latent heat from water vapor condensation or evaporation. The dry adiabat lines, as the name suggests, represents how temperature would change for a parcel that is subsaturated, or taking the perspective of a parcel lifted from the surface, we would say the rate at which a parcel would cool if it is unsaturated and thus, thus no latent heat is released. The other set of adiabat lines, and the last set of lines on the diagram, are moist adiabats. The moist adiabats, as the name suggests, represents how temperature would change for a parcel that is saturated with respect to water vapor. Or taking the perspective of a parcel lifted from the surface, we would say the rate at which a lifted parcel would cool if it is saturated and thus latent heat from condensation of water vapor is being released. Notice that the moist adiabatic lapse rate, the rate of temperature change, is almost the same as the dry adiabatic lapse rate at temperatures below negative 40 degrees Celsius. The slopes of the two sets of green lines are nearly parallel. This is because the saturation mixing ratio, and thus water vapor content, is so small at such cold temperatures that there is very little release of latent heat, even in saturated parcels. On the other hand, a saturated parcel at around 30 degrees Celsius can have orders of magnitude more water vapor content, and thus latent heat release can inhibit cooling much more effectively at these temperatures. The result is that moist and dry adiabatic lapse rates are much more different at warmer temperatures. The slopes of the two sets of green lines are far from parallel. Note that even at very warm temperatures, the moist adiabatic lapse rate is still showing cooling with height, even though it tilts towards the right in the skewed temperature coordinate. Okay, those are the five sets of lines on the skew T log P diagram. Now let's look at the most common way such a diagram is used in meteorology. This is the practice of calculating how a parcel's temperature will change with height under a hypothetical scenario in which the parcel is lifted to the top of the diagram. In order to do this, we need to know both the parcel's temperature at the surface as well as its dew point temperature. We can see that the dew point temperature is below that of the temperature, so we know that the parcel is starting off subsaturated. That means that if the parcel were to be lifted through the atmosphere, it would initially follow a dry adiabat. But as it is lifted, the parcel will not remain subsaturated indefinitely. The dew point temperature also cools slightly as the parcel is lifted due to decreases in pressure. The dew point cools at a rate that conserves the water vapor mixing ratio. We are not adding or subtracting water from this hypothetical parcel. So the dew point will follow the line of constant water vapor mixing ratio. Once the parcel's dew point temperature is the same as its temperature, the mixing ratio is the same as the saturation mixing ratio, and the relative humidity is 100%. We call this point in height the lifting condensation level, or LCL. This is where we would expect the base of a cloud to form. So in this case, the LCL is 1.2 kilometers in elevation. After the LCL point is reached, the parcel will no longer cool at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Now, as the parcel is lifted further, it will be releasing latent heat due to condensation of water vapor, and it will still cool, but at a less rapid rate. It will cool at the moist adiabatic lapse rate. Note that we made all these calculations without vertical measurements of temperature or dew point from a weather balloon or radiosonde. However, if we are interested in knowing something about the stability or lack thereof of the atmosphere, we need at least access to the vertical measurements of temperature. Specifically, in order to evaluate the stability of the atmosphere, we need to know whether a raised parcel will tend to be warmer or cooler than its surrounding environment. If the parcel is warmer than the environment, it will be less dense than the environment and will have a natural tendency to continue to rise. If the parcel is colder than the environment, it will be more dense than the environment and will have a natural tendency to sink back down to its original location. Let's imagine that we launched a weather balloon and we recorded this profile, which re represents the surrounding background environment for which our hypothetical parcel is lifted into. You can see that, initially, a lifted parcel is colder than the surrounding environment, and thus the parcel is more dense than the environment and will naturally want to sink back down to where it came from. Thus, this is a stable layer of the atmosphere. We call this area between the environmental lapse rate and the hypothetical trajectory of the parcel convective inhibition, or SIN, because it is inhibiting convection. However, eventually, if the parcel is lifted through this layer of convective inhibition, the parcel will reach the same temperature as its environment. 
After this point, the parcel is less dense than the environment and convection will naturally take place. We call this point in height the level of free convection, which is in this case 3.5 kilometers. Thus, this is an unstable layer of the atmosphere. We call the area between the environmental lapse rate and the hypothetical trajectory of the parcel, in this case, convective available potential energy, or CAPE. Now a cooler upper atmosphere would mean more CAPE, all else being equal, and more potential for very strong updrafts that could support, for example, hail formation. On the other hand, a warmer atmospheric profile like this would imply inhibition of convection throughout the atmosphere, and thus there is no level of free convection here. Note also that down here we have plotted a temperature inversion. Temperature actually increases with height here, which is a signature of a very stable layer of the atmosphere. It's also worth noting that you don't need a vertical dew point temperature profile to calculate any of the metrics we have discussed so far. You only need the dew point at the surface, which tells you how much moisture is in the parcel initially. One important caveat to all this is that this is all a very idealized mental model. Thinking about how a hypothetical parcel's temperature compares to its surrounding environment's temperature only works to a point because eventually, if enough parcels are lifted, you will change the environmental temperature profile. And in fact, the environmental temperature profile is constantly changing. It's not really static. But despite that caveat, this type of analysis is still very useful for assessing the stability and or instability of the atmosphere. And there are many, many more useful meteorological insights that can come from analysis of skew-t log-p diagrams.